Hello everyone, my name is Dr Andrew Retta and I'm Volition's Chief Medical Officer. Thank you very much for joining us today. What we're going to go through now is a series of short presentations and educational slides to really try and get across the importance of natosis and why we think it's so important for our understanding of sepsis and developing new uh, diagnostic tests and hopefully treatments in the future. What is natosis? Well, it's the process by which uh, a neutrophil releases its DNA to trap microorganisms. This next slide shows the classical function of a neutrophil. We see this sort of slug-like thing moving around the slide, hunting two diplococcal bacteria, and then it engulfs them and digests them and destroys them. And certainly when I was at medical school and in medical textbooks, you learn that this is the major function of neutrophils, the phagocytosis, this enveloping and ingestion of microorganisms. But we've learned now that neutrophils do three things. They can degranulate and release toxic molecules, reactive oxygen species to damage and destroy invading pathogens. They can phagocytose invading microorganisms, just as we showed on that video a few moments ago. And now we understand that they can release nets, neutrophil extracellular traps. Nets were only discovered in 2004. They were initially very controversial but now it's well established that nets are released. We think there are at least three patterns of net release and understanding what's genuine net release, what's slightly artificial from a laboratory and what represents true disease is a really fascinating and evolving area of research. We at Volition are incredibly excited because our H3.1 assay is an excellent marker of natosis and we hope to operationalize that and bring it to clinicians to help diagnose and monitor disease states. This next slide looks like a sort of multicolored picture of the universe to me. Actually, it's been taken by our team in our innovation lab in California. And what it shows is you can see this green wavy material moving predominantly from left to right across the screen. And that's DNA being picked up and staining. And this is DNA ejected and released from neutrophils. And this is what we're picking up and studying. And this is what the H3.1 antibody actually detects. And so that's a picture of nets in the real world, so to speak. What is the process of natosis? This slide just shows a healthy resting neutrophil with an intact nuclear membrane, with intact cytoplasm, and with an intact cellular membrane with regular arrangement of actin fibers in the cell membrane. It becomes activated or it detects a microorganism or is signaled that there's danger, come and help. The first thing that happens is that in the cell membrane, in the neutrophil membrane, you get breakdown and rearrangement of the actin fibers. That's essentially the scaffold which helps the cell maintain its integrity. The neutrophil then starts to bud off and release microvesicles, which contain lots of other inflammatory signals to recruit and alert the immune system that there is a danger signal occurring. Then we start to see the nucleus of the neutrophil. Uh, the nucleus is where all the DNA is maintained. It swells and decondenses, ultimately forming into a round blob, which progressively increases in size with increased shedding of extracellular vesicles to fill the whole cell. And then finally, you get this eruption of DNA, an ejection of DNA from behind the neutrophil. And that's a really toxic membrane to capture, encapsulate and trap microorganisms, particularly bacteria, but also viruses and also fungi. And these proteins ejected behind the cell are decorated with um, lots of inflammatory signals to signal and talk to the immune system. Again, essentially just a danger signal telling other immune cells to come and help, uh, including platelets, monocytes, macrophages, and other high order cells in the immune system. I love this picture. This is a picture of natosis occurring in real time. You can see these pink mushroom clouds erupting behind the neutrophils. The pink mushroom clouds are neutrophil extracellular trap nets and they're picked up and staining in this picture. What you can see at the bottom of this slide is a scale from 0 to 50 micrometers. And what's really important to understand is that a normal capillary, the very smallest blood vessels where gas exchange occurs and there's the exchange of nutrients from cells delivering nutrients and taking toxins and waste products away generally are 20 to 30 microns across. 
So you can see how a neutrophil extracellular trap can completely occlude um, the whole of the capillary. And one of its other major functions is it essentially acts as a scaffold for immune cells to sort of bind onto and do their work. This is just a summary slide pulling together everything we've covered in those last few slides. And it's putting a slight time frame on it. In the experiments we've just shown you, it takes about two hours, somewhere between 80 and perhaps 140 minutes for this decondensation of the neutrophil occur, to occur and for all the DNA material to be released. This slide is really important to volition. And again, this is work done by our innovation laboratory. What we're doing here is triggering neutrophils and seeing the release of neutrophil extracellular traps over time and seeing how well this correlates with the H3.1 signal. What we're seeing here is we've stimulated the cells. It takes about an hour before there's any DNA release. And then you can see the orangey line, which goes up with the triangles on it. And that's picking up a cytox green signal. That's picking up the DNA in neutrophil extracellular traps. And then correlating extremely well with it thereafter is the H3.1 level. There is a slight lag, but you can see it picks up and correlates extremely well. And we've repeated this experiment innumerable times to confirm and show it. And actually it's one of the key findings picked up in our recent publication by Kieran Zuckus. Going forward, we're beginning to understand that there's more than one type of natosis. Indeed, we think there are three types of natosis, and that's what we show in this slide here. You see the neutrophil being stimulated and going through that pattern of decondensation. The first type of natosis is called suicidal natosis. There's such a violent reaction inside the cell that it ejects all its DNA material and essentially it's wrecked, it's destroyed afterwards. And you can see the lysed neutrophil breaking down. We're starting to think that this is perhaps an artifact of our laboratory experiments, leading to excessive neutrophil stimulation. It almost certainly does occur in some specific instances in nature, in us, when we're sick, but that's probably slightly unusual and not typical of classical infections. What we think is more common is the middle line here, vital natosis, where the cell becomes activated, where it ejects its DNA, but then essentially you have a, a cell remaining without DNA in it, which is still able to phagocytose, that sort of gobbling up function we mentioned before. Looping back to our innovation lab here and the papers by uh, Kieran Zuckus and recently by Brandy Atterbury are really picking up these different mechanisms of natosis now and showing the patterns and kinetics of their release and models for stimulating neutrophils. We are incredibly proud of the innovative work the innovation team are doing and their work has received really favourable feedback in the field. We've got a series of publications coming on that throughout the end of this year and early next year too. Finally, the last type of notosis, which has most recently been described is mitochondrial notosis. Mitochondria are these little batteries inside cells which are factories producing energy for the cell to work. They can also release their DNA and what happens is you then have a neutrophil with its mitochondria ejected. Mitochondrial DNA is thought to be particularly toxic uh, and occur in some specific types of sepsis too. And there's a lot more work going on to understand that better. What happens? What does this DNA do? What damage does it cause? How does it signal to other cells? And we've covered that in this slide here, talking about multiple sources of histones and nucleosomes. We don't really have cell-free DNA. A pure double helix on its own just gets hydrolyzed and gobbled up in our plasma incredibly quickly. It's unstable and doesn't work. But what we do have is DNA present in the form of nucleosomes. That's DNA wrapped around a histone core. And that's really what we're detecting with H3.1. We know that extracellular histones can be directly toxic to a large number of tissues. They're directly toxic to endothelium, the lining of blood vessels. They damage the endothelial cells. They can talk to platelets or histones interact with platelets, these tiny little anuclear fragments of cells involved in blood clotting, but also so critical to our immune response. They activate platelets. They activate complement and talk with complement. And then complement gives a feed forward loop, further stimulating neutrophils and further stimulating platelets to cause further net release and so you can get a sort of vicious cycle of inflammation occurring. On the other side of this graph 
we can see that histones activate macrophages, they activate T cells, and can lead to toll like receptor 2 and toll like receptor 4 activation. Those receptors on the surface of cells ultimately lead to pathways leading to an increased inflammatory response. And so what you can see is that when you get excessive release of histones in a breakdown, is it toxic to a huge number of organ tissues. The final point we're trying to make in this slide is that you can get nucleosomes in your blood from multiple sources. Our cells turn over, so we all have a low level of H3.1 in our blood, perhaps less than 30 nanograms per mil. But when you have excessive cell death, particularly from sepsis, over 80% of your nucleosomes are coming from neutrophils. And again, that's work we've done with our innovation lab to prove. And so that's why you've got necrosis and apoptosis at the top of the side, suggesting there are multiple sources of H3.1 in sepsis. This slide is complicated. It's taken from a paper by Professor Richard Hotchkiss and is trying to describe the trajectory of sepsis. So far, we've talked about the science basis of H3.1 but really we want H3.1 to be a tool that helps clinicians diagnose, treat, and monitor patients. There's been multiple attempts over time to diagnose sepsis to enable research. But what these slides are trying to say is that a patient's trajectory and a patient's condition change over time. In the first part of sepsis, we have a really inflammatory phase where there's lots of activation of cytokines, lots of activation of your immune system, a really vigorous response to try and fight off the invading microorganism. That response gets tempered because we can't have uncontrolled inflammation as we'll damage our own tissues. And so what we're talking about here is really a wavy line as patients can sometimes get stuck in some sort of purgatory state where they oscillate between hyperinflammation and immunosuppression. H3.1 very much looks to be an excellent marker of this hyper-inflammatory phase of sepsis. And that should help us as doctors and as clinicians to identify the patients with the greatest inflammatory response and perhaps even a disordered or excessive inflammatory response to infection. Everyone understands that there is more than one type of sepsis but trying to split the sepsis cake into sort of consistent and coherent patterns has proved incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult for doctors. This paper was published at the end of last year in intensive care medicine by Amstel and a number of colleagues. What does this very complicated Sankey plots show? Basically shows that in the major studies trying to identify subtypes of sepsis, there was little agreement between the studies and how one group classified patients with sepsis was inconsistent across the multiple groups, that they just varied. And this shows the huge problem of doing research in sepsis. Small uh, alterations in the study population, very subtle uh, differences in methodology used to study the patients, uh, leads to really quite wide variations in results. We're really excited as we've got three large research projects coming to fruition over the summer, hoping to show a consistent signal in the inflammatory response with H3.1. Thank you for listening so far. In summary, in this section, we've covered what neutrophils do, how neutrophils get stimulated to release neutrophil extracellular traps, how the excessive release of neutrophil extracellular traps can damage tissues and organs, how we hope that H3.1 uh, from neutrophil extracellular traps is an excellent marker of, of netosis and how hopefully understanding the trajectories and release of netosis in sepsis will increase our understanding and show different types of sepsis going forward. Volition is a science company, a diagnostics company and a company desperately trying to provide tools for clinicians to help the management of patients. We're really proud of the work from our innovation laboratory, proving the science behind H3.1. Our first publication is now in print with Zucker et al. And that really shows how H3.1 correlates with net release. We've got further papers coming out over the course of the year, showing how H3.1 correlates with different types of netosis and different types of signaling to stimulate netosis. Our next paper by Brandy Atterbury is available on BioArchives. 
and we're hoping to have the formal publication towards the end of the year. We've got three to four more publications coming this year underpinning the science. But as I said a moment ago, the clinical picture is so important too, and we have two more clinical publications coming towards the end of this year showing the clinical utility and role of H3.1 in diagnosing and monitoring patients with sepsis. Thank you for joining me and thank you for staying to the end of this presentation uh, on how uh, netosis occurs and the role of H3.1. I hope you join me for our next presentation on how H3.1 works. Thank you.